Um, thank you, Scott, and everyone at the APRL for uh, invi inviting me to be here this weekend. Um, as Scott mentioned, um, I joined the H.R. Harmer family uh, about two and a half years ago now. I was one of the YPLF fellows and through a um, sort of serendipitous uh, turn of events, ended up at the Monaco uh, uh, International Show in 2015. Um, met with a couple of gentlemen there who own an auction house in Germany, Heinrich Kohler. And it was through them that uh, I got to sort of learn the ins and outs of the auction business. I interned over in Germany for two months, um, fell in love with the auction business immediately, realized this was something I, I really wanted to do with the rest of my life. And they told me that they had an auction house in Southern California, happened to be about 15 minutes down the street from where I was living at the time. And uh, it just seemed too good to be true. So that's how I got roped into the H.R. Harmer family. Uh, and one of the things that really captivated me was the great history behind this company. Uh, a lot of the great American auction houses, whether it's Kelleher or Siegel or Harmer, have these great legacies, this great uh, prestige behind them. And my own personal collecting interest, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure many of you do, but I collect anything having to do with Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, basically the relief programs that he put into place uh, between 1933 and the start of World War II. And H.R. Harmer first really rose to prominence in the United States with the sale of the Roosevelt Collection in 1946. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but that was one of the things that really hooked me on this company, the fact that we had this great personal cl uh, connection with the Roosevelt Collection and the Roosevelt Estate. Um, I immediately immersed myself in the history of this company. Uh, when, I, when I got my start there and then um, you know, first started getting acquainted with the company, one of the things that obsessed me was this wall of auction catalogs going back to our first U.S. sale in 1940. These are the original auctioneer's copies, every U.S. sale that's been held since 1940, um, all leather bound with uh, you know, the auctioneer's notes and the margins and everything. Uh, I just thought this would be such a wonderful resource to teach myself about the history of the company, and, and I very quickly uh, set about to learn as much as possible. So today I'm just going to be talking a little bit about the brief history of the company uh, from 1918 to present. I know I said 1940, that's when we were founded in the United States. I'll touch on that in a minute, but uh, we were first founded in 1918 in London. Um, so I'll go into a little bit about that, as well as the interplay between an auction house and a philatelic library. I think it's very interesting. Um, how auction houses can contribute to the uh, dispersion of philatelic knowledge and how we can help to uh, make these resources available for the general public. So I'll touch on H.R. Harmer's history as well as H.R. Harmer's relationship with philatelic literature through the years. We've had a couple of projects over the years uh, that have, um, I think, contributed to philatelic knowledge and philatelic understanding. So I'm going to highlight those as I work, again, very uh, cursory through the history of the company chronologically. So. Um, in the most basic terms, uh, the history of H.R. Harmer really revolves around these two men, both Henry Revel Harmer and his son, Bernard Harmer. Uh, Henry Harmer had a couple of sons, one of whom, Cyril, was the go-to expert on uh, Newfoundland airmails. I saw his book is available downstairs in the, uh, in the gift shop. Um, but Bernard is really the one who um, brought the H.R. Harmer name to America. Uh, Henry Revel Harmer got his start as a stamp dealer in the uh, 1880s, 1890s. Uh, he's a child, basically, and then worked his way up the ranks. Um, got embroiled in a couple of scandals with some uh, African stamps and some counterfeits and had sort of a, a checkered history in the Victorian era, uh, but really legitimized himself, became a, a world-renowned expert on Venezuela, uh, developed a, a world-class, worldwide collection of fakes and forgeries, and uh, really established himself as a prominent member of the British philatelic scene by the early 1900s. Uh, it was in 1908 that he held his first auction on Bond Street in London. Uh, what I think is really poignant about this talk today, the first auction was held November 9th, 1918. So uh, we're just five days shy of the actual 100th anniversary of H.R. Harmer. So when Scott told me the timing of this, I thought it was very serendipitous that the APRL is celebrating their 50th while we're celebrating our 100th. So. Um, so that's really where H.R. Harmer got their start in 1918. Um, when I was in London a couple of months ago, I visited uh, one of the Harmer offices on Bond Street. It's now, it was a Dolce & Gabbana until recently. Now I don't even remember what it is. It's got a Rolex store in there. But uh, this was the home of H.R. Harmer for many, many years in London. And uh, that's a big thing that I like to do. When I was in New York, I visited our former offices in New York. I want to go stand where uh, my my 
forefathers made history with this company and uh, being able to see the original Bond Street location of these auctions, uh, the place that's photographed so many times in catalogs and annual resumes and such, I thought was, um, was, was very uh, poignant in a way. So H.R. Harmer, like I said, first auction in 1918, we really made a splash, we really made international headlines in 1933 um, with the sale of the Heinz Collection. This is from the third sale, which was a year later in 1934. The Heinz Collection was, after Ferrari, maybe the biggest philatelic sale in history up until this point. Certainly captivated audiences uh, and bidders and collectors and even non-collectors around the world. I think uh, if you look at what the gross sale did um, a couple of weeks ago, that sort of coverage in the mainstream press as well as the philatelic press, um, that's really what Harmer captured uh, with the Heinz sale. Uh, Harmer did not, as far as I know, sell the U.S. portion of the collection. That was sold in the United States. I don't remember the auctioneer's name, but in Europe, the Heinz collection really uh, put H.R. Harmer on the map. Again, maybe the biggest sale after the Ferrari collection. So you've got this, this gap of you know, 16 years or so where, where Harmer fills the void and, and recaptivates the public with a philatelic auction. Um, in the late 1930s, as World War II was looming on the horizon, the folks at H.R. Harmer realized that they needed a backup plan of sorts if they were going to survive the war. Um, you know, God forbid uh, the UK were to fall. They wanted a, a second option, uh, which is why they started exploring a US office. Now, it wasn't just because of the war. Obviously, having offices on two different continents was, was a good business model. But uh, from what I've read, it was, it was really the looming uh, threat of World War II that uh, led Harmer to uh, add operations overseas. And it was really Bernard, again, uh, our founder's son, who took things over in the U.S. He was really the, uh, the captain of the U.S. operation. Very quickly rose to prominence, uh, became one of the biggest American auctioneers, uh, in large part because of, as I mentioned earlier, the Franklin Roosevelt Collection. The Roosevelt Collection has been derided by some as being of little philatelic importance, and I would agree that there are certainly many more impressive sales if you're looking at it from purely a philatelic point of view. Roosevelt had some great things, had some, some really phenomenal items in his collection, but a lot of it was subpar material. It was letters he'd been sent from around the world or um, just you know, cheap little things that he'd collected. But I think what makes the Roosevelt series of sales, there were four of them in 1946 and 47, and what makes these so important is not the material that was in the sales, but rather the way the United States and worldwide public was captivated and obsessed by these, um, by these auctions. Roosevelt was very prominent with his, uh, very vocal about his stamp collecting. He was very open about it. This quote from 1932 was featured uh, in the front of the first Roosevelt catalog. And he said, I, I owe my life to my hobbies, especially stamp collecting. So in life, Roosevelt was very vocal about stamp collecting. And in death, this really elevated the uh, philatelic hobby to new mainstream uh, publicity. Uh, this is just one example. Here you can see um, Bernard looking at the Roosevelt collection in the days before the auction. Roosevelt died in 1945, late 45, 46. The estate was trying to figure out what to do. Roosevelt himself had requested that his material make it back out onto the philatelic market. And again, this is from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Headlines like this can be found in papers across the country and around the world. Um, and what's really interesting is, is people who were not in the know about stamp collecting were wowed by these realizations of ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. They didn't realize that Ferrari, Hind, many men had sold their collections for much more than Roosevelt. People were, were still impressed by the big numbers. But uh, again, for me, it's not about Roosevelt's actual philatelic holdings. I think what's important is, uh, is, is the widespread publicity he brought to the hobby uh, in life and especially in death. The next big milestone in H.R. Harmer, I think you could argue, uh, began in 1955, the Alfred Caspery collection, which went on for uh, several years, is still considered to be one of the most important collections ever assembled. Uh, the Royal has a series of black and white photographs of every page in his collection, and I've spent hours just poring over his collection. Uh, many of the most identifiable items in philately were in uh, the Caspery collection, uh, the Alexandria Blue Boy, and just countless other um, big ticket items. The Life magazine that came out around this time, a lot of those items were in the Caspery sale. And um, 
this again captivated people both in the philatelic world and outside of the philatelic world. Um, this is just one example of a newspaper article written around that time, right around the time of the first sale. Um, Bernard Harmer again is looking through uh, St. Louis Bears from the Caspary sale. Um, and there was another uh, big sale of St. Louis Bears slightly before this. So St. Louis Bears are one of those iconic items that seems to captivate the press for whatever reason. And, um, and, and again, this image shows I like to think they played things up for the photographers. I don't, I'm not sure that the policeman standing behind them is necessary, and I'll show you another picture in a second, but I really think this was important in presenting an image of these huge ticket items, things selling for tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I think that the salesmanship in the, in the philatelic auction world at this time uh, was exceptional. Life magazine did an entire photo shoot of the Caspary sales, which were held in New York in 1955 and 56. Um, again, here you can see a Harmer employee um, with a briefcase of material and, of course, an armed policeman uh, keeping a close eye on her as she does this. Not sure that the uh, cops in full uniform were necessary to the successful execution of a sale, but it adds to the drama, it adds to the intrigue, it adds to the, uh, the wow factor of these sales. And again, these pictures were printed in Life magazine um, and really show not only uh, the quality of the material, but also the pomp and circumstance that went into an auction back in the day. Um, I can speak for ourselves and things I hear from other firms that the um, in-person physical aspect of auctions is not what it was even 20, 30 years ago. Um, I enjoyed going to the gross sale myself because it reminded me of these photographs. It reminded me of the things that I see from the 50s and 60s, the uh, glory days of auctions. I think it's fun that that can still be recaptured when you've got something as remarkable as the Gross Collection. Um, but again, this picture I just think is very evocative and, and really shows uh, what things were like in the heyday of H.R. Harmer, which I would say is the 40s to the 60s, really, is when our company was at our, our cultural and commercial peak. And then the last of the major uh, mid-20th century sales, I would say, was the sale of the Louise Boyd Dale and Alfred Lichtenstein collections. Uh, which actually continued up until 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there was so much material that these sales never seemed to end. It took uh, many decades to um, sell all of the, the Dale Lichtenstein collection. Uh, and what I think is fun about this is inside the preview for the Dale Lichtenstein collection, it says that H.R. Harmer was at the time celebrating their 50th anniversary. So the Dale Lichtenstein collections kicked off around the same time the APRL was founded. So when we were celebrating our 50th, the APRL was being born, and now the APRL is celebrating their 50th. We're celebrating our 100th. So I thought the timing of this was, was very fun. Uh, not only is this time of year the 50th anniversary, anniversary of the library, uh, but it's also the 50th anniversary of uh, the kickoff of the Dell Lichtenstein collection. So um, one thing I've been impressed with the learning about the history of the company is not only that we are business-minded and you know obviously trying to hold the best auctions possible, trying to make as much money possible with our auctions, but from the start, we've been very, and again, this is my interpretation of my country, company's history, and I may be a bit biased, but it seems like Harmer has always been very focused on um, adding to the philatelic knowledge bank. Um, we've always been, I think, interested on, on contributing to the world of philatelic literature, uh, starting with Harmer's Stamp Hints, which was first published in 1940. The APRL has a complete run of all nine issues. It went through 1947. Um, it was originally quarterly, but Anybody who knows basic math can tell that 1940 to 1947, quarterly, there should be 36 issues, not nine. Uh, what happened was the war really slowed things down, and it got to the point at the end where they were publishing it annually. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think this is a really fantastic magazine. It was co-edited by Harmer and Prescott Thorpe, who was one of the renowned experts on postal stationery, and he even wrote a couple of original articles in here. Um, that are sort of expanded forms of his uh, catalog listings. And there's great insight about what it was like to buy at auction in the 1940s, how you would bid in the 1940s. It really um, puts you into the shoes of somebody who would have been buying from H.R. Harmer um, all those years ago. So um, again, this is sort of where we kicked off our contributions to the philatelic literature. And I think it's still an important resource, still a very fun resource to look at. So um, I'm grateful. We don't even have a complete run in our office. We've only got the first couple issues. So to be able to see all nine issues is, don't, don't ask me why. That, that's what I inherited and I've been trying to fill in the gaps 
in our library. Um, the other book that I think is, or I, book is too strong a word, pamphlet, uh, that I think is important to mention is this Modern Methods of Philatelic Auctioneering, which for much of the middle of the 20th century was really one of the go-to uh, resources for how to sell at auction, how to build a collection, what you should be looking for, do's and don'ts of, of um, buying and selling. And uh, th this pamphlet was published all the way through the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken. So this thing had a, a shelf life of, of about 40 years, obviously with updates and revisions and whatnot, but it really is um, still a wonderful uh, trip down memory lane, even though I have no memories of um, philatelic auctions in the 1940s and 50s. But um, a couple of fun things that I think uh, are, are important to point out. H.R. Um, Harmer was the first auction house to do a lot of things. H.R. Um, Harmer was the first to do specialized sales of just one country, just one area. Um, so a specialized sale of British Africa or a specialized sale of British North America. We were, we were the sort of pioneers in uh, that, that philosophy of not just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what stuck, but actually trying to give the collectors um, something a bit more in-depth and a bit more specialized. Uh, we were the first to include color images in our auction catalogs, which was very, very expensive at the time and all the way up through the 80s and 90s and has only become um, more feasible in the last uh, last couple of decades, but back in the 1940s and 50s, you'll see that there's usually one or two pages, maybe even just the back cover that were printed in full color, which uh, again seems like no big deal at all today, but at the time was was a real step in the right direction. Um, we were also the first to illustrate stamps with the description instead of just a photo plate and a page of text. We tried to intersperse things and just make it a bit more interesting. So I like to think that Harmer's. Uh, we're kind of pioneers in the field of auction catalog design. Um, we're still trying to reinvent things and, uh, and, and modernize things today, but I think it's fun to look back on what Harmer's accomplished all those years ago. I also think it's fun to see what an auction looked like. That's Bernard calling the sale. Um, you can see the room is packed. I wish we had a floor like this at our auctions. We've got usually an agent or two and a handful of people, and we've got the phones ringing like crazy and the internet pinging like crazy. So um, back then, there obviously weren't those alternatives. People had to pack into the room like sardines. Uh, again, anybody who's been to an auction in the last 20 years can tell you it looks nothing like this today, but, uh, but it's not for lack of interest or lack of bidding. It's just that people are bidding in different ways that are more convenient than having to fly to Southern California. So some pictures of the Harmer office, um, which look nothing like our offices today. Um, again, you can see another, another auction being called and a full staff of secretaries in the upper left. And again, this is completely different from what the auction world is today, but um, these photographs from Modern Methods of Philatelic Auctioneering are, um, are very fun to me as somebody who never got to live through these glory days of auctions. I think it's, uh, it's fun to see how things once were and, and contrast that with um, what we've got today. So. I'm going to end by talking about the future of H.R. Harmer and philatelic literature. At the New York show in 2016, we published the book on the left, which is the Ari von Haub collection of Postmasters Provisionals, both US and Confederate. Um, Mr. Haub uh, has, until his death in March of this year, built one of the most impressive United States collections, um, I think, of all time. I, I, I don't think I'm overstating things. Um, whether it's Waterbury, Fancy Cancellations, Pony Expresses, Provisionals, Confederates, uh, general postal history, you name it, he, um, he really put together some, some remarkable items. And we wanted to, when I say we, I'm referring to not only just H.R. Harmer, but the Global Philatelic Network. I mentioned that I interned in Germany. We've got companies in Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, Hong Kong, and the US. And, and the group of us, we call ourselves the Global Philatelic Network. Um, are really trying to preserve these collections for future generations, trying to record them and publish them and put them out there so that even after these things are sold someday and dispersed amongst you know, dozens of different collections, we want there to be a, a physical record uh, of these collections. So in that same spirit, on the right, you can see a book in our series of books called The Edition Dior. This one is the Michael Mailer Collection of United States Civil War Era Fiscal History. Um, I'm sure most of you guys know Mike. He's put together an absolutely phenomenal collection of revenue documents. Um, one champion of champions with it. One large gold internationally with it. And uh, as a as a tribute to his collecting, we wanted to take everything, scan it in high quality, 
um, include all of his notes, all of his research and everything, and uh, preserve this for future generations. So this is one direction that we're heading into the future. We want to preserve collections that will be broken down. At the same time, I think it's really important to preserve the past as well, uh, which is why I have been going through, we've, like I said, we've got our wall of leather-bound H.R. Harmer catalogs. I've been going through and trying to buy duplicates of as much as possible so that I can cut them up and put them in a document feeder and scan them and get scans first of the important name sales, uh, but eventually someday scans of everything um, onto our website for people to search and use. Um, Siegel has uh, led the way in that. They have been an exemplary um, you know, gold standard of, of how an auction house should preserve their past and uh, you know, taking a, a page out of their playbook. I hope that H.R. Harmer can do the same thing someday. So right now I'm working on scanning the Caspery and Lichtenstein sales. Those should be online within the next couple of months. And after that, we'll go to Roosevelt. We'll go to, uh, we sold stuff from Ashbrook's collection. We sold stuff from the uh, Y. Surin stock. And, and again, some great, um, you know, Mount Rushmore names in the history of philately uh, are going to be my primary priority um, in terms of getting those online. Uh, but eventually, I would love to see, uh, maybe even with the help of the APRL, Scott, um, a complete run of H.R. Harmer catalogs digitized, freely accessible to anybody who, uh, who wants to see them. So, um, again, in the, in the next couple of years, we're both looking towards the future as well as to preserving our past um, now that it's so easy to digitize these things and make them available. So that's a bit about the history of H.R. Harmer and a bit about where H.R. Harmer is going. And if anybody has any questions, I would love to answer them. But thank you all for being here and listening to me uh, ramble for a couple of minutes.